Hey, um, if you have our church app, you can read along the notes with us this morning. Otherwise, the team will have it on the screen. And um, I really believe this is a word in season for us as a church. Uh, it's not a coincidence, it's a word in season. And um, I'm praying that you're blessed as much as I was and, and learning from this as well. But um, I've titled this message, I'm Moving Forward. Turn to your neighbour and tell them I'm moving forward. If you don't have one, find someone, tell them from afar. You can turn around, Matthew, there's someone there. Say, I'm moving forward. Now, for the person that you didn't talk to who turned to you and hoped that you'd turn to them, you can turn to them and tell them as well and say, I'm moving forward. There's always that moment where you think they're gonna turn to you and they turn to the other person and then you're left standing looking around. Don't worry, we got you, we got you. But I'm moving forward. The DNA of this house and our heart and my goal regrettably is to make you feel uncomfortable. Who loves being uncomfortable? Some of you um, at the ADM service, I'm pretty sure there was only basically three people who said they like to be uncomfortable and the rest of the people who come to the eight raised their hand just said they love to be comfortable. And um, immediately I thought, Great, you're uncomfortable right now. And um, this year, I think God has given me the gift of discomfort uh, to move forward. And um, I really believe God's gonna do something profound in this church. But you know, our ultimate goal as a church is to make everyone feel like family. That if you want to be involved, you can be involved. The opportunity is there that if you make the effort, we meet the effort. That there is no way that you should feel an outsider or even ostracised in this church. If you're new, we're honoured that you're here. We'll talk to you, we'll walk with you, uh, we'll even baptise you and even take your photo. But eventually it's gonna get to a place where we simply nudge you and say, when was the last time you took a risk for God. We're gonna nudge you and say, when was the last time you weren't playing life safe? When was the last time you actually believed that God had more for you than you ever could ask, think or imagine and you actually dared to believe Him to do the miraculous works in your life? So when was the last time you endeavoured to move forward? You know, the Christian life, I believe, was never intended to be a place of playing it safe. It was never intended to be predictable. Church, even today, was never intended that you just expect the same thing every week, every time that church starts, that worship ends, that the, the sermon ends and you sneak out before the service finishes. It was never intended to be predictable. And the majority of us may feel more comfortable living a safe and predictable life, but I, leave, I believe the best Christian life is not a safe life. The best Christian life is a walk of faith. In 2 Corinthians 5 verse 7, it says, for we walk by faith and not by sight. So I'm gonna ask you a question that's really been resonating deep within my heart this year. And it's something that will resonate the whole year within my heart and challenge me in, in greater ways than I could explain. So I'll, I'll begin by asking, who in the room believes in the Bible? Raise your hand. And you don't have to raise your hand just because, you know, your neighbour's raising your hand. But nice and high, who believes in the Bible? Majority of us, that's great. But I really believe this. And I'm gonna use my name for reference so none of you feel that I'm picking on you, but apply it in your, in your own life. See, there is the Bible that Josiah knows. I know the Bible. I believe the Bible. And there is the Bible that Josiah knows. And then there's the Bible that Josiah lives. And my goal between now and when I go to glory is to close that gap. And this has been resonating in my heart really so deeply this year, that there's the Bible I know, the Bible I believe, the God that I understand, and there's the life that I'm actually living and my life this year, and my goal is to close the gap from what I know to what I do. 
And I think that should be our ultimate goal for life that as every month goes by, as every year goes by, we're not just coming expecting the same thing, but we're saying what I know and what I'm doing, let's close the gap. That I'm not striving for perfection, but I'm striving for progress. That in 2023, I'm endeavouring to close the gap from what I believe to what I do. Are you with me? by the way that we risk, by the way that we live, by the way that we play it safe, often at times is not in alignment with the God that we say that we serve. See, we know that we serve God, the Creator of the universe. We know that we serve a God that caused things that are not as though they were and He caused dead things to life. And we know that we serve a God that has called us for a purpose, for a plan, a hope and a future. But this is the contradicting thing, that the way that we risk and the way that we live our life is often not in alignment with the God that we say we serve in the Bible. So would we endeavour to close the gap this year? If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Genesis 17. I'll be reading from verse 15 to 21 in the Holman. Um, A little bit about, a little bit of context into this passage if you're not aware of the Bible as as fond as some. In in Genesis 17 in the Old Testament, uh, we come across a passage of Scripture about Abraham, who we call the father of faith, and Sarah or Sarai as she was. And Sarah, his wife, was barren, meaning she couldn't have children until she was 90 years of age. And God promised Abraham that she would be a mother of nations in Genesis 17, 6, and that she would conceive and bear a son. But Sarah, the Bible says, did not believe. And the Bible reiterates, if you read Genesis, um, that Abraham was seven, uh, 10 years older than Sarah, And assuming that Sarah had married at the average age in that era of 16, then by the time Ishmael was born, which was, he was born through Haggai, their slave, Abraham and Sarah had possibly been married 60 years and still had no children through his wife, Sarah. Who knows, 60 years married minimum is a long time to come to a belief of you're gonna have children, right? And in Genesis 17, verse 15, it says this, God said to Abraham, as for your wife, Sarai, do not call her Sarai, for Sarah will be her name. I will bless her and indeed, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her and she will produce nations. Kings of people will come from your wife, Sarah. Abraham fell face down. Then he laughed and said to himself, Can a child be born to a hundred year old man? Who wants to have a child at a hundred? Raise your hand. Can a child be born to a hundred year old man? I will give you a son by her and I will bless her and she will, sorry, I'm reading the same verse before I got distracted. Can a child be born to a hundred year old man? Can Sarah, a 90 year old woman give birth? So Abraham said to God, if only Ishmael were acceptable to you. But God said, no, your wife Sarah will bear you a son and you will name him Isaac and I will confirm my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his future offspring. As for Ishmael, I have heard you and I will certainly bless him. I will make him fruitful and multiply him greatly. I will, uh, he will father 12 tribal leaders and I will make him into a great nation. I will confirm my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you at this time next year. What a great passage of Scripture. I'm going to unfold it in a way that maybe some of you may not have heard. And um, I've written down three points that I want to really unfold this message this morning. Um, And I pray encourages you in ways that it encouraged me. And, And my first point is this, forget the voice of your past. Turn to neighbour and say, forget the voice of your past. If you're not taking notes, you should take notes because I do say statistically, if you take notes, you get to heaven. It's a joke, it's a joke. But um, if you do take notes, this is always a good point to take. Uh, Forget the voice of your past. You know, one of our favourite Scriptures as Christians, we love to quote Scripture to help encourage us in our years and our months and our days. 
And one of those favourite verses that we use is Isaiah 43, 19, which says, look, I'm about to do something new. Even now it is coming, do you not see it? Who loves to quote Isaiah 43, 19? Look, I'm doing a new thing, anyone? Cool. Uh, We often neglect verse 18, which verse 18 says, do not remember the past events. Pay no attention to the things of old. And many times when we're believing God to do something new, God says, let go of the past, let go of your old mindset to make room for the new. See, everyone in this room, which would be pretty accurate, has a phone. Would that be accurate? Everyone in this room has a phone. Yes. If you don't, we're praying for you or that's probably why you never answer your phone. Um, But everyone in this room today has a phone. And within that phone, we all have some beautiful memories that we call photos. Anyone else have photos? Yes, I'm not the only one. And those photos represent treasurable moments and instances of friends, families and loved ones, those that may be here and may be some that are not. And one of my favourite things to do with my kids often at night is to reflect on the photos and the videos that were memorable. Moments that made us laugh, moments that bring us back to an instance or a moment to when my son was two and not five. And my kids and I love to reflect upon those moments and we laugh and we ponder and we cherish those memories. And the reality is, is that most of our life is focused on what was. You go to your camera roll and reflect upon the moments that what was. My wallpaper consists of photos of days that have been. Even the majority of us have photos in our house that consist of memories and moments that were in the past. We have the same thing. And we all tend to enjoy living in the past and enjoy focusing on the past because it's very easy. It's very easy for me to reflect on the past. It's very hard for me to remind myself of what I'm believing God to do this year. And it's easy because we have an emotional attachment to that memory. When I see a photo of my son when he was two, I, my five senses immediately take me back to that moment. Because you've experienced it, because you've felt it, you've smelt it, you've tasted it, you've seen it and you've heard it. And immediately our five senses are attached to a memory or a moment in our life. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with being connected to our past. Let me make that clear. There's nothing wrong with being connected to our past. It's hard to forget the past when our five senses are attached to the hurt or the pain or the joy that once was. And when God says in Isaiah 43, forget the past, let me bring some clarity. He's not necessarily saying forget the mistakes, forget the pain or forget the sin of your past. But when you read Isaiah 43 from verse 1, God walks the Israelites through the miracles He performs. And from verse one all the way down, God says to them, do you remember the time I carried you through the fire? And they say, yeah, I remember God. And do you remember the time I brought you through the rivers and and, and the waters did not overcome you? And the Israelites saying, yes, we remember God. And, And the children are saying, yes, God, we remember. And then God says, okay, now don't, don't dwell on the past. It's not that your past are bad, it could be good as the God said, but both the bad and the good can prohibit us from moving into what God has for us. See, to forget does not mean it leaves your mind because a lot of my past made me a better person. But it means to leave the influence of my heart that I don't allow my past to influence my future. I don't allow my past to influence my heart and my decisions for today. See, I'll never forget my past, but I also don't go back to my past to ask permission for my future. See, your past has a voice. 
And it's continually, continu- continually telling you what you can and cannot be done. You either listen to the voice of your future or you listen to the voice of your past. See, I don't hate my past. I don't curse my past. I don't ignore what happened in my past, but I do not allow my past to have the authority over my future. Are you with me? That's like a great time to agree. See, in the following chapter in Genesis 18, as we read when when God spoke to Abraham and Sarah in chapter 17, the very next verse or chapter in 18, God comes back again to remind Abraham and Sarah because the Bible said that Sarah did not believe. And in Genesis 18, two angels in the Lord shop to Abraham, the Bible says three men and one of them being the Lord. And the Lord reiterated to Abraham, by this time next year, your wife Sarah is going to be having a baby. The thing is, when the angel came to visit Abraham, Sarah was in the tent, the Bible says, and Sarah was just listening by her ear, not involved in the conversation. And the funny thing is, as Sarah could hear the conversation from the tent, she began to laugh that God said, Sarah is gonna have a baby. Because why would a 90-year-old woman and a 100-year-old husband have a child? Why would a woman that is 90 years of age who has been barren her whole life automatically now give birth to a son? And it says this in Genesis 18, verse 13, it says, But the Lord asked Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? saying, can I really have a baby when I'm old? And the Lord said, is anything impossible for the Lord? And He said, at the appointed time, I will come back to you. And in about a year, she will have a son. Don't you love that God is so kind that He doesn't just give you a chance, but He comes to reinstate the chance. See, I I really believe this is so profound and I think it's often neglected. That the reason why Sarah laughed is because she had a 90 year past telling her what never would happen. She didn't laugh because she didn't believe God. She didn't laugh because she didn't believe that God could do a miracle. She laughed because she had a 90 year past telling her what would never be done. So the Lord said, your son will be called Isaac, which means laughter, because Sarah, I never want you to forget how you laughed at my promise. Because you had 90 years of telling you no, Yet 90 years of no has to bow to the very word of yes from God. See, I believe it's not just our past that hindrances us. It's the voice of our past that stops us. See, I believe so profoundly that it was 90 years of Sarah's past that prohibited her from believing that God would give her a miracle. Are you with me? And point number two is this, see the future. Turn to your neighbour and tell them, see the future. See the future. You know, we believe that you don't just have to believe, but you have to see it. That the Lord appeared to Abraham and Sarah a second time because He wanted them to see the future. And when our past becomes the dominant voice to our life, we'll never step into the future that God has for our life. See, God is all-knowing. God is all-powerful and God is ever-present. God knows the future and He has a plan for all of our lives. Why? Because if there's a breath in your lungs, there is a call and a plan for your life. See, God's plan is perfect. God's timing is perfect. And His motive and heart of love is for your good. 
this year, in 2023, we have sensed that this year is a new year or as we're calling it in our vision book, that this is a new day. Next year, we're unfolding the message that this is a new day. The old has gone and the new has come. You know, it's crazy to believe that three years ago, we were faced with a worldwide pandemic that literally flipped the world upside down in ways that we never thought could even be possible. It changed the way we did church. Church shut down for three months physically. We couldn't even open a door, let alone run a group or meet with you in person for three months. And that pandemic changed the world that we live in. It changed people's priorities. It changed the way we function as a church. It changed the way we could meet as a church. And and for the years gone by, church has been one step forward, two steps back. But for us as the pastoral team, we have sensed that this year is unlike the recent years we've ever had. The beginning of this year has been unlike any other year. And I'll let you into some insight. For us as a church, not just in COVID, but years prior, January was always the quietest month of our church. It was a time that we come out of Christmas, New Year's, uh, just the holiday festivities and, and things that we're so consumed by on the weekend and going away, that January was always the time that we knew was the quietest time in our church. This January that's been, has been the most busiest year we have had for years that we can't even remember. That people are coming that don't even come to this church, they're calling the church home, new visitors are coming. Uh, People are are coming with expectation and a hunger in their heart that worship at the 9.30 has been unlike any other week. Why? Because there is an expectation and a hunger for the things of God. I don't know what is causing it, but I do know that whatever is happening, we wanna perceive it and grasp it and run with it. See, people are hungry. People are wanting more of God. New people are getting connected to the church every week. Why? I don't know, but I do know that God is doing something because it is a new day. See, if we cannot perceive the future, we will miss the opportunity. We will miss what God has in store for us and simply laugh at our future like Sarah, as Genesis 17 said, that Sarah did not believe. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, and the new is here. Walt Disney, as many of us know from Disney, was fired from his job because he was told that he lacked imagination. If he had focused on what he was told, there would have never been a Disney corporation or their worldwide theme parks. Colonel Sanders, the very place that we all love called KFC, was 62 years old with $105, tried to start a a fried chicken franchise with his recipe. And after 1,009 rejections, he worked a deal with a restaurant in Utah and the Kentucky Fried Chicken franchise was born. Look, I'll be honest, after the 10th time, I get that, I get it but he won 1,009. Thomas Edison invented the light bulb and he is quoted for saying, I haven't failed, I've just found 10,000 ways that don't work. Everything that we want in life is usually on the other side of a painful decision. Financially, in your health, in your relationships, in your marriage, friendships, business, career, everything that you want in life is going to be attached to sacrifice and an inconvenience. It was inconvenience for Abraham and Sarah to believe for a baby at 90 and 100 years of age. You're you're really meant to wind down. Many times we miss what God is doing because we say God is doing a new thing. If the keyboardist could come up, please. 
How many times have, have we believed God to do something new? Isaiah 40 through 19, God is doing a new thing. And we think, well, God, you're gonna give me my old job back. God, you're gonna give me that person back, that old friend. You're gonna give me what I once had. And we think, God, you're gonna restore what was taken. And yet God says, I'm doing a new thing. And the reason why we can't see it is because we tend to sometimes look for an old thing rather than a new thing because our five senses are attached to the old memory of an old thing. And it's easy. It's easy for me to go back to what was because I've already been there before, but it's so hard to step into where I've never been. And it's even harder when our five senses are attached to a memory. And God says to Joshua in chapter 3, verse 4, when he crossed the Jordan and walked into the promised land as a spy, God said to Joshua, I understand you went to the promised land before, but you went as a spy. And God said to him in Joshua 3, verse 4, He said, but you've never been this way before. See, when Joshua first went in to spy out the land, He then came back and then many years later went into the land, but he went into the land with an old mindset of a spy. Yet God says, you've got to change your mentality as a conqueror, not a spy. Because you'll never conquer the land if you're coming in as a spy hiding all the time. See, if we approach 2023, like the year 2022, we won't ever move forward in the season because you're walking to a new thing with an old mentality. As God said to Joshua, you're not a spy anymore. You're a conqueror. So you've got to change your mentality. You've got to change the way you see. And how many times do we struggle to see the future? How many times do we struggle to grasp what God wants to do in the year because we think, well, God, just do what you did last year. I was speaking to a pastor friend of mine, which is so amazing. And he he sort of lost his church and felt God closing it down. And it was very hard for him because he said to me, It's very hard to close something when you don't know what you're going into. And he said, I I would have loved if, if what God told me, I knew why I was doing it, but I walked into the unknown of, I don't know what I'm doing. And yet as months went by, God's now restored him. He's given him better and bigger things with a church and, and God's given him what he desired. But how often and how hard it is to close something yet we can't see the future because we've never been this way before. And yet that scares us because we love to have a connection to the memory. A photo isn't a photo unless you have your senses attached to the photo. We love memories. We love when life's predictable. We love when we understand that church is gonna go this way and I'm gonna leave and I'm going this time. And and, and we love when we grasp predictability. Yet as God said to Sarah and Abraham, see the future. I believe prophetically this morning that there is a person or persons this morning that you're struggling to see the future. As Sarah and Abraham couldn't see the future, it wasn't because they didn't believe in God, but you've had 10 years of no. You've had five years of it won't happen as Sarah had a 90 year of barrenness, she said it won't happen. 
and we allow the voice of our past to dictate our future. And my last point is this, and it's so simple, confess it. Confess it. I believe that in order to step in and move forward into all that God has for us as a church and a community, we have to not listen to the voice of our past. We have to see our future and then we have to confess it. And I believe this so importantly, that your future is on the tip of your tongue. Everything God has for you this year, your plans, your hope, your future is on the tip of your tongue. Isaiah 55 verse 11 says, So shall my word be that goes from my mouth, that it shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Saying that whatever came from my mouth, I'm sending to God. God's Word says, if you have the courage to say it, if you can discern it, if you can declare it, if you can confess it, if you know it and recognise it, the Bible says you will see it. By your faith, you will be healed. And even if God's timing doesn't align up with your timing, God is faithful. Sarah lost hope because she had a dream and a, and a prophetic word that she would bear a child. And because she had 90 years of barrenness, she allowed her past to dictate her future that when God said, you're gonna have a child at 90, she laughed. Because she had a 90 year past telling her what would never be done. I really believe that this year, if we could endeavour to close the gap, we would see more of what God has for our life this year than we have in all of past years gone. As we said, Majority of this room believe in the Bible. We believe in the Word of God. We believe that what we read about is living and active today. That Jesus isn't just some fictional character that we've read about, but Jesus is active and alive today. That the same Jesus who healed and restored and, and, and opened blind eyes and raised the dead is still active and living today. That is the Bible that we read and understand. Am I right? that there is the Bible that I know and then there's the Bible that I'm living. And what if this year we could close the gap? That what we know, we believe. That our belief and our living would be in alignment with the way that we see God. That if I believe God for a miracle, He will do it. That if I believe, if I steward my life and what God has given me to the best of my ability, God will give me more. That I don't just have faith without works, that I don't just believe for a job, but I'm proactive and I go do something, that I'm, I have faith and works. What if we could close the gap this year? Because I'm endeavouring that this year and years that will go by until my day goes to be to glory, that I'm endeavouring to close the gap from what I believe and to what I do. Can we bow our head and close our eyes, please? Holy Spirit, I just thank You for today. God, I thank You for Your Word. I thank You that Your Word never goes void.
God, I, have, I pray that we would have more moments like this morning where we would just make room for Your presence. Even just as the keyboard is playing, I just sense the Spirit of God is just doing something that I cannot contain. If you're in the room this morning and you say, Pastor Josiah, I'm not walking with God. I'm not where I should be. I'm not where I'm meant to be. And maybe this morning you came into church and, and you don't know what to feel, but you sense that this room is different. The presence of God is different. You've never ever felt before. That I wanna remind you that there is a loving, living God who loves you, who died on a cross on Calvary so that you could walk in the freedom and the purpose and the call over your life. That if there is breath in your lungs, there is a purpose for your life on earth. And if you say, Josiah, I've walked away from God or I've never invited God into my life, I wanna give you an opportunity right now that you can invite Jesus as your Lord and Saviour. Why? Because one, Jesus loves you so much. Two, your life will never ever be the same again. And three, if that's you and you say, Pastor Josiah, I'm not walking with God, I'm not where I should be, just raise your hand where you are and I would love just the opportunity to pray with you. I love a moment that we can invite the living God into your life, that you could begin to experience a life transformation power that is present in everyone else in this room today. And if you're online and you say that's you and, and, and you're raising your hand in your living room or in your car or wherever you may be, just where you are, there's a little pop-up link that's gonna show up. And if you fill out that link, one of our pastors will rally beside you this week. We'll walk with you, we'll stand with you and we'll believe for more over your life. But with all head bowed and eyes closed, if, if this message spoke to you and maybe you're believing for an intervention, maybe you're believing for God to just intervene a situation, whether it's relationally, uh, maritally, financially, physically, emotionally, just where you are, just stand without anyone looking around. Why? Because we believe in the power of prayer. That God is so kind, He is so gentle, that God will never force Himself on you, but He wants an invitation. Just like when we raise our hands and worship, we're saying, God, I surrender. So many times we hold into our life with a clenched fist, but God says, if you could just let me in, if you could just release it, I could do more. So God, over every man and woman that is standing, God, I pray over them right now. I speak for the hand of God to be evident upon them. God, I pray that You would bless them, that in their acknowledgement, Holy Spirit, You would give them love, You'd give them peace, You'd give them joy, God, You'd give them favour. God, as they steward the life that You've given them as You've placed on their life, God, I pray as they faithfully steward the call of God upon their life, You are faithful. Father, Speak to us. Give us an awareness in our day and in our week that church or Christianity would not just be an expectation, but it would be an opportunity for God to do something new. So we speak it and we believe it. And we all said, Amen.